have a, a very special guest here on our curriculum we're very excited about. Uh, we're going to do a phone interview here with uh, a very good friend of mine, um, Jake Cox. Jake is currently an assistant um, football transition coach down at Baylor. Uh, he's been there for a year. Now I don't want to steal too much of his story. He's going to kind of start off by telling us the marathon of plays that he's been. But this dude is uh, one of the smartest guys in the industry. He is, uh, for, for me, he's, he's very well experienced. He's been a ton of different places. So he uh, has a lot of different, he's seen a lot of different ways and um, very well versed. So I'm very excited for this one. I think it's going to be one of the best ones we've done yet. So excited for you guys. Uh, Coach Cox, you there? Yes, sir. Good to be here. Thankful to be on your show, Coach. Nah, I appreciate you coming on, man. We've been been trying to get get you on here for uh, for really since we started going. So this is one I've been super excited about. Um, I guess it's a start, man. I mean, like I said, you've 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 been probably places I don't even know about. So uh, just so maybe people can kind of connect with you a little bit, tell a little about yourself, and um, how'd you end up at Baylor? Absolutely, I'd love to do that. Um, why don't you go backwards? You know, so a little bit of that. I, uh, so I'm at Baylor University now. I'm the Associate Director of Athlete Performance for Football. Uh, coach Jeremy Scott is our head strength coach. He's our head director of performance for football. Uh, awesome friend of mine. And uh, so going backwards, before I accepted this position, I was at Philadelphia University uh, as the head strength conditioning coach overseeing all sports and uh, specifically football. Uh, there was a fortunate opportunity when I got to build a Howie Long Sports Performance Room um, and, you know, two playoff appearances in three years. And, you know, fortunately, a couple of NFL draft picks and a couple of players who went on to play and just phenomenal coaching staff to be a part of the way they recruit and the way they build young men and their character along with the administration that was absolutely first class. Before that, I spent one year at Temple University and that was with uh, Coach Matt Rule and Coach Jeremy Scott, their very first year at Temple. Uh, prior to that, coming on that staff, I was at uh, University of Colorado for two years as Director of Sports Nutrition and Assistant Football Strength Conditioning Coach. Prior to that, I was actually uh, an active grip for a brief time. I spent a year as uh, Assistant Strength Conditioning Coach there. It was my first full-time job out of grad school. And before that, I was at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas for two years as a GA for Dan Ethan. Uh, in between there, that summer, between those two years, I was an intern for Chris Doyle at uh, Iowa with their football program. And before I started that GA position, I did my, one of my, I did my third internship with uh, Baylor University. So long story short, about nine years later, I'm back here in Waco. Um, and before that, I interned at Mid-American Nazarene in NAIA school in Kansas City with Wicked Rodden and Tom Cross. Um, and before that, I was an intern at my alma mater, Kansas, uh, with Derek Hunter and had the chance to learn from Jim and Chris Dawson. And I spent my playing day at Kansas with uh, Coach Chris Dawson uh, there. And before that, I'm originally from Iowa. So I, I wanted to let your guys in this profession just from the standpoint of if it hadn't been for football, if it hadn't been for the work ethic my parents and my, my high school coaches and uh, my junior college coach and my, my coaches at Kansas that further me, I wouldn't be here. And simply put, I, I probably had gone to some nothing wrong with it, but I've probably gone to some two-year institution, uh, and, and I'd probably be working at the factory, and right now I'd probably have three kids and get in small town, going to work. Uh, I don't wish nothing wrong with that. I absolutely love that. Very respectful. But when you look at it in that perspective, you know, so many things and so many things in this profession fall into the right time, right space with the right people and the right situation. Uh, I've been very fortunate and blessed in this profession. Uh, it's not without its ups and downs, but there's certainly so many more ups than there are downs. So that's my, my background and going reverse order with it. Uh, so next question. Yeah, no, that's a that's a freaking novel, man. That's what, like I said, that's my favorite thing about Coach Cox is he is uh, he's well versed, man. He has been everywhere, so I love to pick his brain about everything. But um, all right, man. So 
I I always somehow manage on this show to get caught up in the house, which I mean it's probably a good thing because it's way more important than the what's. <laughs> but uh, I'm gonna try to stay on task here today with you and and because you've been so many places and because I love I love hearing you talk about programming. I'm gonna try to stick to the what's. Um, we'll try we'll try to go through that, but. Um, so obviously you've been to freaking 1,500 different places, uh, and you've been in this industry for a long time. What what is your training philosophy? You know, what are your X's and your O's? Yeah, and, and one thing I instantly say that away, and I'll try to tell any young coach in this profession or any old coach in this profession is this: I've been in 11 years uh, as a coach, and I tell you what, every single year there's been quite a bit different than the year before. Not that there hasn't been quite a bit the same, but there's consistently differences year to year, staff to staff, facility to facility, manpower to manpower. And, you know, the work kicks up, you know, you, I think um, you track, you're asking me more or less like kind of how I design things or my philosophy behind things. And I think it should be stated, my philosophy is based on some principles that really can adhere to how many other racks you have, how many other work um, paid interns, part-time interns, staffing, equipment, whatever you have, you can adapt to that situation. So I tell you, any, any coach, you know, there's obviously, the longer you're in it, you find out there's so many more ways to skin the cat and get the job done, that's, that's for sure. Um, so it, flipping on that, whether you're a four day a week program, five day a week, three day a week, however that is, I'm fortunately been a part of, you know, when I was younger, maybe I didn't want to do certain things. Uh, but then you open up and you're like, you know, uh, I don't mind going this well in a squat progression as long as certain parameters are being taken care of. And I don't mind going this well with frequency of uh, squatting, pressing, pulling, and hinging uh, being taken place. Uh, there, there's still principles that need to be adhered to and to develop your philosophy. And along the way, I just really like telling a lot of people these days. I, I like people kind of think of my, it's the rules of coaching I'm huge on. No matter what you're doing, number one, do no harm. So in a lot of respects, you know, one thing I learned, for example, I was at Villanova, we would recruit very well. And due to the numbers at an FCS school, being 63 scholarships, and we want to get freshmen until the last first. Well, when that's taking place, it's apparent two to five of those true freshmen are going to walk over that field and play game one or game six on and finish the season potentially as a starter. I mean, they're going to experience over 20 plays a game through that team. They're going to do that whether I'm the straight coach or not. Um, so, do no harm. So whatever you're doing for that 30 days or 60 days before they get to camp, make sure that they're camp ready for their coaches, but it's going with the philosophy of do no harm. Um, they're going to be the player they should be, at least in those early years, uh, when they're 17, 18, 19, regardless of you. If they were going to play on the field, they are going to play regardless of your expertise or what you bring to the table. Uh, rule number one, do no harm. Rule number two, all they see is all there is. All they hear is all they know. And that's kind of something I broke up from the book Decisive by the Heath Brothers, uh, slash Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Um, you know, a lot of this in our profession, understand you're going to wear a lot of hats. I do a lot of eccentric things or extrovert things that truthfully really potentially aren't my personality. Uh, I have some introvert personality. Um, that certainly have grown, but I, I do have quite a bit of extra burden in me, and it's knowing what hat to wear at the right time in the right situation. I think that's a huge skill that you want to know to show coaches you can have a command over an entire team, and you can have their buy-in of all the players, and you want to show the players that you've got the buy-in of the coaches and administration. Uh, do no harm. All they see is all there is. All they hear is all they know. Rule number three, no work less time. Really come to understand that the athlete's entire goal uh, from any level, whether it's NAI, FCS, Power 5, Group of 5, it, it's, it's not their goal. It's just the human nature to do less and be lazy. 
And if we're people that put a structure and discipline into these individuals, which I hopefully we all are first and foremost, then we need to teach them to get more work done in less time. If an athlete can do 90 minutes worth of work in three hours, they're going to take that 90 minutes and do that work for the three hours. But if we can get 90 minutes worth of work done in 60 minutes, then that's a goal that's accomplished. And so some respect, a lot of them, that goes towards building their general physical preparation and making sure that they have a disciplined attitude towards hustling from station to station. And some of that is kind of learning the right path, making sure they know things can be done here a certain way, discipline, organized, and structured. Uh, truthfully, a lot of your football coaches or any administrator, they'll come down, and I've always heard this philosophy big, is that we want anybody, whether it's their parent, the athletic director, or sport coach, to think two things when they come down here. One, whatever these athletes are doing, looks incredibly great. And two, they are giving maximal effort. So they might not have respect for step-up progression, split squats, chin-offs, RDL, teams, snatches, but they respect organization, structure, and certainly never having injuries taking place in the weight room. And they, they, they respect and expect hustle and a fast work pace. Um, so that's rule number three, no work, less time. Rule number four, four, if it looks like crap, it is crap. If you wouldn't do it with your six to 12 year old child, then don't do it. That's kind of the bonus round there. But rule number one, do no harm. Rule number two, all they see is all there is and all, you, all they hear is all they know. Uh, definitely do those two right away. And then the third one, let's get more work done in less time. Let's not stand around, we've never been sitting in our weight room. I think that's something I learned right away from Coach Chris Thompson, who's now at Kansas State. You'd never ever sit in that weight room, ever. Um, and then there's been some other mentors along the way where you just see that up tempo pace and the heavy weights are still being lifted. You know, we don't need five minutes of rest between this this maximal attempt here. Let's let's go and let's work. Uh, let's train, not test. Uh, number three, no work less time. Number four, if it looks like crap, it is crap. Make sure when people come to your facility, uh, if you're going to do Olympic lifts, make sure they see them look good. First and foremost, if they're going to see chin ups, make sure they're full range of motion, unless there's some shoulder pathology that specifically, I don't know, some medical doctor you know told you about. Make sure you don't see them just bouncing up and down in a half, 90 degree flex elbow. Make sure it's the right thing. Um, everybody's doing some form of squat, chin up, RDL, or bench. Make sure that when people come to your facility and see those movements, they're seeing things that don't look like crap. Because if everybody's doing it, you should become a skilled technician of how to coach or relate that to your athlete. Now, if you're doing some sort of rotational med ball throw, and it's not, like, that's something specific to whatever institution you're at. Or if you're at some private performance center and you've got a flywheel and you're doing something, I would tell interns or assistants, don't look at everything that everybody's doing that's different. Look at the things that are the same. So do no harm, all they see is all there is, all they hear is all they know, no work less time, it looks like crap, it is crap. The bonus with uh, principles about how to go about it is, if you do it with your six to 12 year old child, then don't do it. And a big thing I try to give is, don't, um, don't overestimate your athletes. Don't be mean to them by thinking that their, their level of Maslow's hierarchy is greater than a six year old, 10 year old, 18 year olds, oh, because there are 17 to 23 year olds. With that, be respectful of the fact that if you gave them a frozen Snickers bar right now, you may light up with a big smile or a frozen uncrustable, it would light up and been a great day. So understand the stresses that they're going through and understand so many of them did not come here to do a split squat progression. They came here to play ball. Right. So when you're doing things, keep them appropriate for what the athlete is doing in the athlete's training age. That does not mean they cannot progress to a chaos bench press with a fat bar or contrast over speed, plyo jumps or whatever. It just means be appropriate for their training age, they're respectful of your athletes <coughs> and their mental state at the time. Yeah, just just as I expected, that's uh, that's incredible. It's great stuff. I want to go back to a couple things. Um, first off, number three, more work, less time. I think that's 
it's like one thing that we talk about as a no-brainer in this industry like yeah everybody wants to do it but not everybody does it very well and like that's one that's probably there's one thing i pride myself in in our weight room when you come in and look at it is it is absolute organized chaos but the key word there is organized and people say they want to have mm -hmm. they, they want to get more done in less time if you really want to achieve that dude you have to be freaking organized to the t and then on top of that mm -hmm. if you want to keep it safe because you're doing you're doing complex movements you have 12 things going on once you might be doing a tri set like you have to be organized insanely to get that much stuff done um it's why we we, we staff meet before we staff meet after every lift to make sure everybody knows exactly when this band needs to be switched and who's going to watch the uh shoulder raises versus who's going to watch the rdls and you have to be extremely organized so like people say it but i don't think people understand it and, and what goes into that like that's not just a rule that's like a that's a big one that everyone says you know but you have to be a great coach to be able to do that um because of the organization of it so i, I love that um and then the rest the, the rest time you talked about that that's uh it, it's funny because like my my staff I, i'm so i'm so yes or no or black and white about certain things that they always ask me well sleep how do you know how much rest time in between our heavy squat sets um, or our heavy bench. And I just tell them, I'm like, dude, just look at the body language of your athletes. Like, just because the NSCA, CSCS says you have to rest five minutes in between maximal effort, 90% sets, it doesn't mean that you absolutely mm -hmm. do that. If our guy, some of our athletes, if our guys are, are, are sitting there staring at you, waiting for you to blow the whistle to start the third set, they're probably ready to do it. Um, and same goes the other way. If it's if five minutes has come by and those dudes are freaking tongue on the ground and they look like they're dying, well, then maybe you should give them a little bit longer before you start that next set. Um, Absolutely. So I love I love that. I love that as well. Um, that's freaking great stuff. Uh, so is that is that is that pretty much that sums up your very general guidelines? That's that's it, short and it, sweet, it, and I love it. And really have to. I mean, I can go into how I believe standing on your own two feet with the bar in your own two hands is better for the athlete. Um, you know, training in all three planes of motion, making sure you're vertical reaching, vertical pulling, uh, horizontal pressing, horizontal pulling, um, unilateral single leg, hand strength, strength in the stretch position versus the contracting position. I can go into all of that, but truthfully, a lot of that's I mean, I remember being at the facility where I had four power racks, no, uh, excuse me, eight power racks, um, good bars, good plates, and maybe six dumbbells and one blue hammer. Right. You know, but it's sometimes I've, I've been at facilities with 12 double sided full cage racks, you know, 16 trap bars, 16 twist bars, fat bars, yoke bars, bands, chains, you know, tons of space for net ball work. Um, slide board work, battle work, you name it, like, it all changes, you know, and uh, so I suppose the, really the rules, if I'm going to design something, I'm going to be very specific to the aspect of my knowledge base of their ring time on their body, to their injury history, their medical history from the trainers and doctors. I'm going to be something very focused on being conservative first and slow cooking the athlete and um, going that progression. And as I learn of their training age, I will prevent them accordingly. Yeah. Um, so that's that's it. No, I, lo I love the I love the principles. I mean, that's like I said. Most I, I tell like our interns when they're talking about a training philosophy. Tell me, d describe to me the can the, the can of Pringles are in. Don't describe to me every single Pringle. That's not what I want to know when I ask yeah. the training philosophy. I want just describe the can. Don't describe the Pringles to me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah. that that to me that's perfect because. In that, in that same analogy, it don't matter what Pringles in that can, it's all going to be, if you're RDL and if you're benching, if you're squatting, rule number one is going to be don't harm the athlete. Rule number two is going to be all they hear is all they see and so on and so forth. So I love I love that you just freaking rattled off principles. Uh, as a, that's big, I'm big into that. Um, so I get this, the next one might be a freaking tough question because this is especially in our day. So I mean, obviously we're in the information age. Uh, getting information is not difficult now. Uh, I think the thing that separates people is the ability to absorb that knowledge 
and then implement um, that knowledge into their own lives. So obviously, you know, you're you're a huge reader like I am, but at the same time, you've been a lot more places than I've been. So not necessarily just what you read, but each stop you've taken, what why well, is what's your strategy and how you absorb and how you implement um, when you're constantly learning so much? How do you know what to discard? How have you said, okay, that's great? What what's your evaluation process? Um, yeah, I, mean, I, I want to get some details on this stuff. Yeah, so let's just take an example. Like, let's say it's an exercise. Let's say I go visit Kentucky or Arizona, and I see something, or I go visit a local high school here. Uh, especially being down in Texas, we see some great training being taking place in the high schools. Um, and I see something, I'm like, oh, wow, got to have it. That's awesome. Whether that's a machine, a training modality, or that's an exercise being taken place, or like a variation on a squat or a side plank or something. I'm like, oh, I've got to do it. Or let's say I'm looking at Twitter or Instagram and I see something. I'm like, why aren't I doing that? Um, I, I actually stole this for Kent Manny a couple one time, probably about seven years ago. He would not remember me just that way, but that is a great man and a great person in our profession that I've seen a couple of times. And he's just, he's absolutely elite. But he kind of gave me something like this for my young mind. And he um, he said, when we see things like that, and I remember it's full of points, but I, I just remember a couple here. And, and what I do is I think to myself, have I done this myself? So point one, have I done this myself? And with that, if I have it, I'm going to go do that myself. Uh, and the second, has my staff um, done this? So let's say more staff of them, we've got interns, assistants, nutrition, whatever, have they done it? And so we being six foot four or 255 pounds, that's one take on this. But how about my coach who's five two and 180 pounds versus my coach who's six four and 330 pounds? So how do their bodies deal with this variation? And then we get that feedback. And then what we may do is, uh, Maybe it's a testing tool of just a couple of athletes so we get their feedback. And from there, you ask the final question of, would I do this with my own child? And I remember uh, Coach Manny say, you know, have we done it ourselves? Has our staff done it? There's something else. But then definitely the kicker was, would I do this with my own child? And I that would, is I would how do half the I shit thought about with my own child. taking information. <laughs> I said, I wouldn't do half the shit that I've done with my own child. Right? It's an evaluation. <laughs> oh, shit. <coughs> Love it, dude. You there? Cox. Yep. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? All right. Yeah, I can hear you. We're Sorry, back. We're... Hey, is that, is that the edit part? Is that where the intern does the editing on this? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we love it. Uh, all right. What? So, so. How are, your, how are your traps right now? Like, let me just ask you the real important stuff. How are your traps? <laughs> My well, as soon as I'm off off this phone call, we're we're doing a, a, a trap swell session in, in honor of Jake Cox. I mean, yeah. We, had, we actually have a trap progression that's called the Cox, the Cox trap progression. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love it. That's a good be out there. I mean, they name enough random shit after people. Freaking Zotman curls and oh. Peterson this and McGill that. Freaking yeah, might as well be some Fred, might as well be some Cox drugs. Yeah, dude. Might as well. Robertson push-ups. Robertson push-ups, which are yeah. terrible. <laughs> uh, all right, but anyway, so continuing, evaluate with your with your stops. You've been to freaking how many thirteen freaking schools? Like how how did you how did you know? All right, I'm gonna take that. Uh, how did you evaluate? I don't think that would work for me. That wouldn't fit into my philosophy. Like, what have you done? Are you a guy that literally takes notes? Do you have Excel documents? What do you what do you do to, to make sure you you don't forget things, but you bring them place to place, so on and so forth. Yeah, so certainly when I whenever I go visit a staff or um, whether it's private, professional, collegiate, 
I, I do. I take my notebook. I take my pen. I, I ask right away if I can take photos, certain photos of the facility. Because you, you want to ask those things because I know some coaches, they don't like that. They're, they don't like things that are lifting being photographed or anything like that. But you ask it at a time and it's in the notebook. But then you always try to get a little time with those coaches and even the assistants, you know. I mean, a lot of times the assistants can really have a grasp on things in a different light that are big time to you and allow you to see the light. Um, but I, I do, I take diligent notes and then when I am done with them, I try to do kind of a word dump and just kind of lay it out either on Excel or, or a word document and then I'll label it uh, interview Matt Gillespie, um, November 29th, 2017. And, you know, just fortunately, like in a time like May or right before spring break or after spring break or during this time right now, whether it's bull track or no bull track, um, or stay in camp, I'll just open it up and reread it really quickly. And something new will come to life, potentially. And we're talking about like a three minute read. Right. And so it, it's just really helpful because a lot of what I see might not be good where I'm at, with where I'm with, when I'm there right now. But in a few months to 10 years, that could change. And that might have all of a sudden be that's something that could be very valuable to me and my athletes. Absolutely. How do you, uh, how do you, what's your, I guess, deciding process on whether, you know, whether you're reading or whether you're at a conference, what are you thinking about when something kind of perks your interest? You're like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, what, what do you go through to say, okay, that's going to work for me or that's not going to work for me? I'll, I'll be honest. Like sometimes I'll take, depending on the age of the individual, um, I'll go, I'll go twofold here. Like, I'll be a respectful from it, from the standpoint. Uh, say I'm curious, curious about whether an exercise or a, a feed drill technique or recovery modality, I would go ask the individual, and then depending upon what it is, like if it's an injury prevention thing or a recovery modality, I want somebody that has experience being injured. If it's for lower back strengthening, I want you to have been screwed up. Like, I want to read The Gift of Injury by Brian Carroll. I want to learn how to break my core from Chris Duffin. People that have actually implemented Stuart McGill techniques and deadlifted a thousand pounds. I don't want to learn those techniques from people that don't have traps. So that's the meathead side of it. The second point is, do I trust you? And how, how do I trust people right away? I trust people when I meet you. Do you look like you should look like? Do you look like you're, if you're a speed coach, do you look like you're fat? If you're a, if you're a performance coach, can you jump, sprint, deaccelerate, bench, squat? Can you do these things with at least what we would consider right to play numbers and speed? Like, do you have the right to play to give an opinion in this position? Now, if you're 50 beyond, or 60 beyond, I don't, you know, I don't want to judge the answer. Obviously, when I'm taking lessons from somebody who's Sixty or seventy about let's say clean technique or box squat, then you just are more open minded. You look at their background and track record, and you don't have to take maybe such a broad first impression meathead approach to it. Um, and then when you get to know the person or background, you can really dispute whether or not this is something you want to take to your staff, um, and then take to your athletes from there. So that that's really how I do it. Um, I, I ask myself, does this person, what they're talking about, have the right to play in this circle, in this space? Or do they have a weighted opinion high enough for me to care what they're saying? Because if it's just flashing in me, but this person's not accomplished anything, whether it's themselves as an individual or a coach, it's something I'll still write down, but I can't tell you it's going to be something I'm eager to, to get after and implement. Very good. No, I love it. Um, all right, so can I can I brag about you for a minute, Coach Cox? Is that okay? I love I love every bit of the way you're you're going to take this conversation. You just go right ahead. Okay. Um, so <laughs> for everybody who doesn't know, Coach Cox is a He's a financial, he's pretty much a financial meathead and his pockets are on creatine, okay? Um, so he he took over my my retirement account just as far as where I invest my retirements, my retirement funding back in May. So it's been 
seven, eight months, and I, my, my return rate was 9.9, nine, it's now 17.7. I think I've made over $15,000 since that time, um, just on returns. So uh, the dude is, you know, he, and he's put me onto a ton of books, and um, so he is a financial guru. He's pretty much, you, you pretty much run the entire financial department at Baylor now for the football coaches, right, Coach? I've been fortunate enough that I've been able to talk to probably, I'd say, 17 of our staff members. Um, not necessarily our position coaches in season, they're definitely working, but it's really been awesome to talk about finances with some of our uh, support staff, some of our other strength and conditioning coaches, some of our, uh, you know, just other staff members going around, and, and truthfully, even some of our athletes, too. Yep. Um, we talked about wearing a lot of hats. And the art of communication and persuasion are so huge. And what is my level of relating to all my athletes and getting that buy-in and trust? Well, you know, squatting and having quite a big weight and, and that, that's great. So I'm a good technician how to apply squatting principles. But it's really different when we get to know each other and they're sitting in my office having lunch and we're, you know, going back and forth and stuff. And they look over at some of the books and they're like, well, Chris, what's this book or something? And, and then we'll sort of start talking, and then I'll start talking about personal finance or something, and they'll ask questions about it. Or, you know, it just kind of rattles off from there. So I, I have been fortunate that finances and, and money has been another avenue of communication, not only with developing relationships with our staff um, and my friends and colleagues, but certainly our, even our players and athletes. Yeah. No, I mean, see. Moral story, he's, he's very good at this stuff. But I, I talk to my staff, even you know our interns that, that don't make money, um, because I know there's things that I wish I could have done uh, a little differently when I was an intern, or maybe um, I was all, I've always been great at saving money, but necessarily putting it in the right places or looking for the right things, which is really what I've done differently in probably the past year. So those things that I would have known when I was a young age. So we talk about these things all the time, and I know this isn't strength and conditioning, mm -hmm. um, but I think this is beneficial, especially for coaches to hear because I meet so many old broke coaches that had made millions yeah. of dollars and it makes no sense to me. Um, so especially with how volatile our industry is, you know, this might not be a typical curriculum uh, topic, but I want to, if you're, if you're down to talk about it, I want to go through some financial stuff. Absolutely. And I, I think it's important because, as you were saying, you talked with your intern, and we all understand in this business that, um, you know, there's nine position coaches going to be a 10th position coach on the field. Well, if you coach key tackles, you can get a job at DN. You could potentially be the tight end coach, or you could be the running back. You know, there's certain, there's better avenues almost of latching on and staying, maybe at a certain lifestyle income. Or, or, or certain um, employment status versus there's only one head strength coach. There's one associate director, and most places that might be it. And then there's volunteers, and a lot of coaches there are get out of open private facilities or take up life insurance or something else due to financial constraints that as their living expenses arise, they cannot keep up on $32,000 a year. Uh, let alone, oh, I got fired, uh, the wins and losses weren't there, now I have no money, and you can't afford to stay in the game long enough by going into interning or volunteering or driving around your car and networking. Uh, and those that can, as, as I know so many older coaches have even said it, if you want to be in this profession a long time, survive, survive, survive. Yeah. Um, that's truthfully, sadly, it's pretty much the state. You know, you're, you're in it long game, Mostly do your ability to survive. Um, but, and, and as well as also be a quick and also be a great coach, but obviously survive financially. So, yeah, I'd love to talk about money. Yeah, I think, I think to, to start this, I just want to say this because some people will hear, oh, we're going to start talking about finances and they'll cut the episode off because they don't think they make enough money. But the story that I love the most is. Uh, when Tony Robbins refers to, uh, I can't remember if he was a janitor or worked at UPS, but uh, this man, Simpleton. yeah, this, Simpleton. this With UPS, yeah, this yeah. man never made, Third dog, Simpleton. yeah, never made more than fourteen thousand dollars his entire life uh, for a year. His salary yeah. never was more than fourteen thousand dollars, and he retired a millionaire. 
Didn't do anything crazy, didn't hit the freaking lottery, just followed a plan. Um, but it's moral of the story is it's, it's never too early to start, and that's gonna segue me into my question. So obviously, yeah. obviously depending on your salary, it dictates what level of saving and or investing you'll do. So I kinda wanna tier this, tier these next questions. Uh, I'm gonna just ask them all at once. So if you were sitting down with an intern and you were giving them a piece of advice, what would it be? And then to follow those up, if you were sitting down with an assistant who says, you know, is bringing in, you know, they can survive their 30 to 40 grand versus a guy that's made it and he has a significant amount of money and he's making, you know, $100,000 a year. So kind of your different levels of strength conditioning where you have your intern, you have your GA slash assistant, and then you have your, your head position. Um, what, what are your pieces of advice for those different levels? Um, the first piece of advice is it's really create a system of paying yourself first. So the biggest thing is that all three of those individuals need a system that is automatic. Uh, and I would have the intern, I would have anybody with me read a ton of books, but the first one I would tell the intern to grasp this concept of it being automatic is I would have them read Automatic Millionaire by David Foss and I would just really want them to see that even if they're making 500 bucks a month, a thousand bucks a month, that it's the system that leads to success. And when you pay yourself first, when you're young and you're making very little money, your system might be very, very simple. So your system might just be this. We all get direct deposit now with our paycheck. So with that said, I would just say, open up another account and go to your HR and have them put 10%. Now we'll get to the percentages in a second if you can't put it, so let's just start off with 10%. So let's say I make a thousand bucks a month after the government takes their cut. So I make a thousand bucks a month, I'm gonna put 10%, I'm gonna put a hundred dollars each month into this account. That's the pay me account. And then the other 90 can go into this account and that's what I live on, my rent, my gas, my cell phone, my food, etc. But I just want them to start off the basic system of paying themselves first. You have to be a smart, you know, our government's good in certain respects that if you are an employee, not an employer, but if you're an employee, they take their cut first. If you're an employer, I say employee because if you're an employer, you can pay your taxes later. Um, you can work with your money, find expenses, et cetera, et cetera, that's a little more advanced, but you gonna pay yourself later as an employee. An employer, but as an employee, your government's going to take their taxes first, state, federal. Now, what you need to do is before you give the money to yourself, because our natural inc inclination as um, consumers is to spend, 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 and then look around quietly, wondering to yourself, should I pay this money? Okay, so first pay yourself and make it automatic so you can trust yourself. Because I don't trust you and I don't trust myself. So I don't trust anybody to handle their own finances. So you need to get it set up and automated. And you just go to your HR. After you went to your bank, so you went to US Bank, Wells Fargo, Chase Bank, JP, wherever you go to, just ask them for two accounts. And with that one account, no check, no credit, no debit card, nothing. So all you need to get is your routing uh, and your account number, and you take it to your HR, and you just say, I want. 10% here, the rest goes here. And you whip off the other remaining money. So first one, David Bach, automatic millionaire, and it starts your system. Have a system of pay yourself first. The, the second one is, so when you leave your GA or your internship, your paid internship, and let them get that assistant job that you so rightfully deserve, because you deserve it. Uh, please, please pick up the deep sarcasm there. Now, once you do get your 32.5 or potentially maybe that $48,000 job or whatever, I know some states are mandating like 49500 or whatever, 
Uh, some schools are getting around it just like, oh, they're a coach, they're not a faculty or whatever. So whatever you have, um, just set up a little bit more of a, what we probably call a high school system. So the intern system is what we call the first grade system. So let's move to high school. In the high school system, we're going to do an emergency account, which we're going to take all that money from the account you previously were putting money into, and now it'll start rolling into, we're going to just label that account your emergency fund. Uh, you know, and then you can go off to some authors, great one, he obviously, um, Dave Ramsey calls it the God Only Knows Fund, um, which is phenomenal. Um, you know, I, I call it the, the HFS account, uh, but we'll keep that to ourselves. And uh, I think Cliff, you know what that acronym stands for. But, so we're going to call that the Rainy Day Fund, Emergency Fund, God Only Knows Fund. And again, 10%. Then we're going to create another account, and we're going to call that um, our dream account. And let's put 10% in there. And then we're going to create another account now that we're a full-time employee and assistant we're going to just label it passive capital okay so it's passive capital that i want you to do is understand that if you're a private institution it's your 403b if you're at a, um, a public institution it's your 401k or if you're a normal just work for your it's 401k if you're a self-employed it's a step ira um there's about seven different retirement funds that it could be. So this is going to work with your institution. For example, I've been a part of some institutions that automatically put 5% of your salary into retirement. Um, and then if you put another 5 in, they'll, they'll match that. So you could be up to 15% of your salary going into this one account and you'd have only put in 5%. So we're going to label it passive because you can kind of be lazy and get away with this so passive capital so so far we have an emergency account with 10 percent a dream account um, for 10 percent and we have a passive capital for 10 percent and right now your passive it should be aimed at your employer's contribution and then to learn how to work with your employer's contribution you should read the book money mastering the game by tony robbins to learn how to develop your passive capital or work with your institution or company's retirement plan, you should read Money, Mastering the Game by Tony Robbins. And the biggest thing to look at, look at asset allocation, look at cost basis or expense ratio fees, and look at um, your, your, uh, your risk reward and over time. And look at the duration those funds have been in play. You know, you can go to certain companies and they're showing you a fund that's got great growth, but it's based off of other funds that are from the past and they branched and created this fund and this fund's only 18 months old. You want funds that have been around 10, 15 years plus, and you want them to have had a greater return of 7% or hopefully a greater return of 11% over that time. Uh, and then you want to have, again, the appropriate asset allocation. And most of that can be explained in that book. Uh, now you have your emergency fund, and let's talk about that. So we talked about passive capital, get the book, learn about that. Your emergency fund, if you want reading material on really developing this, please go ahead and get something uh, akin to the total money makeover or financial peace university from Dave Ramsey. That's going to help you with your emergency fund and really understanding how to utilize that. Uh, I'll just tell you how I go about building a emergency fund for people. Step one, put the dollars cash in your hand, cash, 10 Benjamin, 20 grand, get them in your hand and put it right by your bedside. Because it's really nice to smell and see and look at every once in a while. And if the washer and dryer breaks, it's right there. If the car transmission breaks, you're going to need a little more than that, but at least you're on your way. If, if you know, the kids need new shoes or whatever, hey, you got it. You know, it, it really helps to limit a lot of stress. And I also say the cash factor because I think too many people go on plastic too often with credit cards and they lose the emotional attachment to seeing cash. 
Um, credit card companies are actually giving discounts now and something up towards the $10,000 to small businesses if they will do away with cash transactions um, and, and they're reducing their fees on their credit card transactions if they will do that. Uh, that's got to tell you something when you read it through the things. That's got to enlighten you with something. You can't be blind. You can't be a sheep. You must understand they're doing it for a reason. It's called make more money. So get familiar with cash. Read the Financial Peace University book that Abraham read his Read Soul Money Makeover. That's going to help you understand those, that real big importance for emergency funds. So number one for me, thousand bucks cash in your hand by your day. Number two, three to six months of expenses placed in a basic account inside of your bank. No checkbook, no credit card book. You actually got to go down to the bank and get it. Three to six months of your life expenses. Gas, transportation, car payment, rent or mortgage, electric, sewer, water. Um, those are your general expenses. Food, those need to be taken care of for at least three, I really preach six months at a minimum. Uh, that's part B. So part one, thousand dollars cash, part B, three to six months expenses in a money market account in your bank, no credit card, no checking book to it at all. You gotta go to the bank and get that money. Part C, this will take a little while, but seven to 18 months of expenses, seven to 18 months of your monthly expenses so that you could get fired and not freak out. So that if you didn't have some reoccurring five or three year rollover contract deal, which I don't think anybody but maybe 15 coaches in your own profession have, that you can be fine. Your family can be fine. The food can be on the table. The bills can be paid. So seven to 18 months ago, take that, open up a brokerage account with Vanguard or Essentially, whatever you like, but when you get to reading some things, you'll understand more about why maybe I would push TIA's prep or Vanguard. But it can be Schwab, it can be t Price, it can be whoever. Um, but open it up and distribute that. And for instance, like um, my favorite would be the Long Term Bond Index Fund from Vanguard. And it's something that's actually got a very conservative considerable return over time, but its volatility is excessively low. So that way you don't just have money sitting around and dying due to inflation. That's a word to write down in Google for some of the audience. But we want to learn and understand having too much cash on hand, not working and growing is a negative thing. Albeit this emergency account, it might take a while to actually get to seven or 18 months. Coach, let me, let me ask you a question real quick. There. Let me interrupt. You've got you. a lot less stress than most people. All right, so just so, so, um, so three to six months, you wouldn't put that in the Vanguard long-term account. You would keep that just in a money market, correct? Yeah, I would. Because a lot of people, you got to think on average, so let's say six months, a lot of people go through like, uh, just normal single person trying to make it as good like 20 to 28 years of age like really just trying to you know from GA to GA to low paid job or whatever that's really probably about 10 grand maybe right. so 10 grand having in cash that doesn't need to be working for me that doesn't I, I'm not going to lose sleep over the inflation on that 10 grand over 20 years I mean you know I'm going to feel better if I can go down to the bank whenever I want and pay in cash, if, if I can go grab out cash in fifty dollar bills and go to that transmission shop, and I can all of a sudden now start to barter and trade with my car. So all of a sudden, maybe my expenses don't cost twenty eight hundred dollars with this credit card because he's got to pay this credit card transaction fee. So maybe I'm talking in cash and I can get some things for twenty two hundred. What's that, the, the Vanguard, now, what's the long-term fund? You said long-term bonded, Vanguard? Yeah, that's just one of them. It could be in a lot of things. It could be in various U.S. treasuries or foreign. It could be in inflation-protected bonds. Um, it's just all that's a good fit for you. But 
that money would be in what I would call just a normal brokerage account, which just means it's an account that's used buying and selling of equities or bonds or essentially commodities. Uh, that's all it is. It's essentially a separate bank account. Now, with that money, if you want it, the reason it still qualifies as an emergency for me is because it's in low-risk um, investments. But at the same time, it would take potentially 36 to 48 hours to 72 hours to get a hold of some of that money. Right. So that's why there's the three parts of your emergency fund. Um, as far as part one, the thousand dollars cash, everybody should still, again, read those two books, get there as fast as you humanly can. Um, you, you just need it. Uh, there's no reason not to have the money. Um, so we talked about passive capital, we talked about emergency. Let's talk about the dream fund. At this point, people have, everybody needs something. You know, you can work for the greatest boss, full of appreciation and autonomy, but you still got a dream. You still got to know why you got to sit in the game and why you're pushing forward in life. So maybe you want a beach house, or maybe you're young and you want that first down payment on your house, or maybe you want that brand new, um, I don't know, Ford Explorer, or some car, or some doodad like that. Um, it, so you got to have a dream. And so if you're saving up for a rainy day, there's a side of you that needs to know you're also saving for the fun, the beach vacation, the, the trips with your, your college buddy. Whatever your dream is, you need to fund it. So let's put 10% to that. And if you really want and really understand the why behind that, it's so much more. Read R. T. Eckert's book, The Millionaire Mindset. And that'll help you really appreciate and understand the dream fund. Where are you where are you putting that investment? What is that? Is that in a low risk fund? Is that in money market? Where are you putting the dream fund? I mean, it really depends on how much that is. Like, you know, sadly my wife and I like some of that. We you know, we keep it just a normal money market account because Let's say we had a dream of buy some, buy some other passive, buy some other property or something, and we want it quicker. Well, you're um, dreaming, yeah, because I mean, you're, you're, you're dreaming now. Some people are investing in for dreams for in 10 years. So I guess you want to go through the difference of that. Like if you're, if you have a dream fund that's for like, hey, I want to have a, I want to buy a house in a year versus, uh, hey, I want to buy an island in 10 years. What's the difference of where yeah. you're going to put your dream fund? And, and really, I would just follow kind of Here's, here's the way I'm thinking it, and that's, I think what we can do is, if you get your dream fund, just follow me here, if you can get $1,000 towards your dream fund, just like part one of the emergency, great. If you can get it to part two, like the emergency, say three to six months of expenses there, that's great. Leave that the money market, leave about, I guess you could do it, three to six months of expenses in a money market, and just pause. And that, when we start talking about bigger things for our dreams, then we're gonna go to, like you said, we're gonna go to that third person you're talking about. Maybe somebody who's making 65, 85, 125, and maybe the $300,000 range here. So we'll elaborate more on this whole dream fund and kind of more on what to do with it when we get to maybe this next position here. But again, for somebody making 32 to, 55,000, I think you're fine just put your dream fund into a separate account. It could be your personal account. It could be something like, hey, my wife has hers, I have mine. So when I want to go out with the boys, that's where my money comes from. When she wants them, you know, to go shopping, that's where her money comes from. So that account, depending on the level, it, it, you want to keep it as simple as possible for the person making 20 to 60,000. Love it. Um, shall we go ahead to the, the third person we're talking about here? Coach, I'm on the freaking edge of my seat, and I cannot wait uh, for you to tell me about the third okay. guy. <coughs> okay, now we, we've kind of got to just touch back on level one's an emergency. Because as you're at this level, um, you would be, it, it would be sad 
Let's let's take as the, as the fashion and as you hit on some of the coaches who, you know, fire their great heights but then don't have it. It would be sad to keep up higher and then, you know, due to the nature of the profession, if it's higher reward with fifty to hundred plus thousand people streaming on your game day, you're not at a cubicle, it's also very high risk. So if you don't like the cubicle life or, or nothing wrong with that, and you like the high risk gambling life that is this, and you made it, it would be very sad to see you write this down. Increase living expenses. I'm not saying you can't enjoy a little bit more of a cushion. You know, maybe you're a health freak, and all of a sudden now you're buying your higher quality supplements or food or, you know, maybe you upgrade the car a little bit. I'm just saying if you don't understand that there's a bad day coming ahead for you, then we call that not feeling in no. Um, period. Because right. regardless, I, I think the longest tenured coach is now like a Kirk Ferentz or Jerry Patterson. You know, that, that's got to tell you something. Right. Uh, period. You know, I, I've been a part of programs that they've gone, come and gone in, in a very short amount of time. And, and I think you got to be knowledgeable of that, especially as you go up. So, and it's nice to see all of a sudden more money going to the direct deposit. It's also wise to maybe uh, allocate expenses a little bit better. So, let's really hit on that emergency. And again, it's the exact same thing. Part one, cash. Part two, month market. Three to six months. Part three, you got to have seven to 18 months in a basic brokerage and very low risk funds. Yes. Okay? So, just, to, just to reiterate, reiterate that point. Now, sorry. And now, we're going to circle back to B on passive capital. So I want to talk about passive capital. And again, remember I hit on your institution's contribution to me. So we've got to maximize that out. But again, if you read the book, Money, Master of the Game by Tony Robbins, and then his now other book, Unshakable, which is a good compliment after you read Money, Master of the Game. Oh, yeah. Today you understand about how to work this passive capital or force to be or 401k better. And you will understand how to allocate your equity, bond, uh, and your portfolio better and look at your expense ratios better. And when you do that, understand now that you're at the higher position, you've got the income to match that out. So potentially when I was an assistant, maybe I was only putting in 500 a month of my salary just to get my full contribution. Well, the government now allows you next year uh, to put in $18,500. So this year they let you put in $18,000 in your contribution, in your employer contribution for so be your 401k. So go ahead now, and that's $1,500 out of your checks pre-tax, I want to slide a note that could be post-tax, that would be a raw conversion. Again, keep on that, we'll talk, you know, we'll talk about that later, but we didn't understand that more. But let's just say it's pre-tax, before the government takes their cut. Um, so $1,500 a month that was there, that equals 12 times 1500 that's going to equal my 18 grand. So now, first off, max that out, because that's your simplest, um, way of adding value to the future here. So next to passive capital, right, 60 years and older. That's who we're thinking about. We're not thinking about the 42, the 53 year old. We're thinking about the 60 year old and older me. We're thinking about the 72 year old, the 91 year old me. We're thinking about my ability to retire on my own means, which by the way, only 15 per, or excuse me, 5% of our country can do, okay? Retire on their own means, meaning they don't have to take on part-time jobs for insurance and, and other issue and supplemental income. So we need to be taking care of the future you. And so many times we're young, their profession was caught up in everything. We're not thinking about that long 
long-term long picture, long-view picture on um, that 50,000 foot view. So right next to Bassett Capital, 50 years and older. Get on with that. That's what we're thinking about. We're thinking about not our kids taking care of us. We're thinking about us having the ability to live on our ranch in Montana or where we want, or our beach home in North Carolina, and still fly and go see our kids in Kentucky or Utah whenever we want. We're thinking about buying the organic apples instead of having to be frugal and getting applesauce in a carton with holder, however you look at it. We're looking at maintaining a great quality of life for the 60, 100 year old youth. Okay, moving down, we're going to now start looking at what we call passive capital. Or excuse me, check, check. Active capital. So part three here, this next part, as we've got this money coming in, we're looking at active capital. And what I want you to note next to active capital is we're thinking about the 59 on down you. So if I'm, let's say, 30 years old, I want to get to a place where I don't need the income of my institution, my employer, or my performance center, or my client. I don't need the income of that to still do what I love. So if I can go volunteer at a D2 school, and I can still maintain my quality of life on my active capital, then more power to you. That, those are the coaches, those are the, the business people who are doing what they love, not because they need the monetary compensation, but because they love it. And that's powerful. Those people do it right more often than not. They speak up when it's appropriate. They prepare to fight for their athletes and fight for their universities and programs more often than the people who unfortunately can't do to monetary um, hardships. So, a, emergency fund, B, passive capital, we're thinking about the 60 to 100 year old us. And C, active capital, we're thinking about how to get between whatever age I am to 59 and, and be able to retire and have all my expenses paid by my, by my uh, active capital adventures. Um, examples of active capital. That could be land, that could be farmland, that could be real estate, that could be raw new timber, that could be uh, maybe when Redbox was big, you bought a few of those. You know, Redbox would have been something you would have actively gone out and sought and purchased those. And then that became a passive form of income, but you actively were engaged in trying to create a profit. So that's why you have to be active in pursuing this. You have to study other fields, you have to know certain things or certain people, you can do joint ventures, but you've got to be setting aside money that you will push towards bringing you more money in the future, a good return on investment in a short number of years, and then from there on out, produce you a income, a monthly income that pays for your expenses. So active capital, well, that, let's just put 10%. So emergency, keep funding that, pass it. Now you're maximizing that. You're going to the max of your contribution. Say 1,500, let's forget that. And then active capital, we'll put in another 10%. And now D, I want you to write down dreams. Okay? And again, we talked about the group account with our, when we were an assistant. Now that we're older, now that we're bigger and we're making better income, let's still keep our dreams alive, but let's be understanding that they may have changed. Usually when I do this, I'll describe how to get your dreams. So you can continue to set aside your 10%. Let's pretend we do that. And then I go around the room and I go, what are your dreams? And I'll hear jet skis, I'll hear RVs, I'll hear beach house, I'll hear, um, a new hunting rifle, I'll hear home gym, I'll hear uh, whatever, I'll hear dreams, you know, traveling, try to get backpacking across the world. Uh, you'll hear these dreams. And what I do is I write all those down and then right next to it, I write first grade. And then somebody will say something like, what's your dream? I'll say, I'm glad you asked. 
and then right below it, I'll put PHD. And I'll say, and I'll just do this. I'll draw a line from my dream, and I'll point it right at my active capital. Because now if I can take the money I'm setting aside from my dream, and I can add it on top of my active capital, I'm going to get there faster. I'm going to buy income properties or income avenues that are going to pay for my jet ski. I think that the jet ski is awesome. Having a jet phone, having a, a hunting tree stand or whatever, I just, I, I think having a brand new uh, fully loaded pickup every two years is an awesome thing. I just want to have something that pays for that. So if I can take my PhD level dream and I can add the money I'm setting aside for my dreams and for my fund and all that, and I can drive it towards my active capital so that I can figure down payments on things, I can get my dream with no worries. And they're only going to continue. If I have a home that produces a $1,000 a month to actual passive capital after the mortgage is paid, then that's a thousand dollars worth more a month of things I can buy. Then I can buy all my new dad, jet phones, new lawnmower, whatever you want. But that's the difference. And that's what needs to be dissociated for people. So part one, emergency. If you can fill that up, do things right. Uh, if you haven't been fired, you will be. B, passive capital, maximize your employer contribution, take advantage of that, read the book, Money Match on the Game, and I'm Shake from like Tony Robbins. If you don't know where, if you don't know concepts, Google them, call me, uh, come sleep, tag my phone number, my personal cell phone on here, I don't care, call me, uh, tag my email. Um, C, active capital, start building up the ability to do what you love without ever needing a single cent from your employer. And then D, your dreams. Understand there's first grade dreams, and then there's PhD level dreams. Yeah, that's uh, freaking incredible. And I think that uh, the biggest thing that I mean, just listening to it, is you got to go back and you got to read those books as well to, to piece everything together. And it's it's uh, it's crazy because you, you've taken a piece of every book and kind of developed, like I said, your system, and it's. It works. It's great, and there's. It's never too early to set up your system. I completely agree. But all the books that you're talking about, that's essential that everybody reads those books to kind of piece everything together and get yeah. that knowledge. Um, but man, that's incredible. Um, oh, I coach. I guess for active capital, go ahead and read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Yeah, that's what I uh, by Robert Kiyosaki. You know, start off there, and then start following. You know anything from now? I mean, just watch and learn YouTube, whatever, and get the books and, and others too. Um, it's like strength conditioning. If we're all squat yeah. and pulling, um, it's like active capital. All the ones doing real estate or land, learn from all of them. But pay attention to ones that are doing it with good technique, doing it with the appropriate load, doing it with great energy. Those are the ones you learn from. Because at the end of the day, you will remember. Don't take it by for people you don't want to trade positions with. Right. No, that's that's great. Um, all right. So obviously, we we you mentioned like seventeen financial books, and I think everybody who while you're hot on this topic, start reading them. But uh, before I let you go, um, just give me a couple podcasts that you're always listening to, um, and then a couple uh, a couple. Of, I, I can't ask you your favorite books. So I know you're like me, and you've read. A thousand of them, but uh, what what are your I guess what are you reading now that's really really changing your life? I'm reading a principle by Ray Dalio. Um, he's the founder. I think he's still the CEO of Bridgewater Capital, the number one hedge fund ever. When you read Money Master in the Game, you'll definitely hear about him. Phenomenal book, amazing. Everybody should read it. Uh, my, some of my favorite books all time, Speed of Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey. Um, I was fortunate to read that when I was at Iowa. Coach, uh, uh, Dora Pacific, Coach Brandon Braceway told me that was one of his favorite books, and it absolutely has been one of mine. I, I tend to read that. 
probably every 12 at least once a year. Also a fan of John Maxwell, the 15 Invaluable Laws Grow. I'm a fan of The Slide Edge by Jeff Olson. I think you would be very, it, it would be very sad for somebody to have not led Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. I'm not saying you have to adhere to all of it. I'm just saying it's something most people need in their lives at one point or another. Um, so I think those are some great books, books and funny points. Um, I, I got it. There's so many. They really think they want to hit you up. And about a certain topic, too, whether it's communication, leadership, finances, and a few other topics. But um, I tend to read within those realms. Um, so those are good books. Podcast. Uh, honestly, it's kind of weird. I'm actually connected with a cousin of mine who does something completely opposite of what I do. Um, you know, he comes back home and He's got his family and everything, but we were connected, which I find is fascinating. We listened to the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. And uh, I think that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tim Ferriss, uh, you actually told me the Tony Salado's podcast, but he was very adamant, so I got, you know, I'm on that now. Um, Stacking Benjamin is a good financial one. I think uh, the Kabuki Strength chat is decent. I should be better at listening to it. I think the order of man is a good one. I think optimal finance daily is nice. Uh, the art of manliness is a good one. Um, Tim Ferriss, obviously phenomenal. And then we look at the film. I like Joe DeFranco. Um, I think the art of charm is a good one. Uh, you know, Marcel's power cap, Marvel shrugs, uh, you know, funny of all of them here. So I really, this year I've actually put it off. I've read less and read more podcasts due to time and, you know, I always got the phone on me, so, um, so I probably slowed down, probably just do a book a week, book every 10 days now, so, um, really enjoy the podcast. I like to, I, more so than the Jocko podcast, I really like Jocko's YouTube. Yeah. This is, um, I just want to recommend everybody go just Google Jocko Good. It's just one of my favorite all-time shout-outs, Thomas Long. And uh, who introduced me to that probably a year ago. And that's just fun to watch. I think that helps keep everybody in perspective. And the last bit cut on this system of money, start now. Don't tell me about why I can't do 10%. Here's the thing. It's not the percentage, it's the system. If you need to do 1% in the second account, do 1%. But then when you Started, it's the starting thing. All of a sudden, if you look at it after two months, you're like, I can do three percent, and you're doing it, and you're like, Wow, money's going in there. You're like, I can do ten. So you get to ten, you gotta start. I want to right now, our percentages are all different. We don't want to put too much away in an emergency. Um, you know, I'm showing you have a different system personally, and the allocations are a little bit different. So the percentages change over time. Start now. And if you don't, you'll be where you, you'll be in the same spot you were right now, 10 years from now. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is today. Take some action. I love it. That's uh, that's probably the best place that we could possibly end this podcast. Uh, or I guess it's a YouTube video. But you know what? You deserve your own podcast, Coach. Uh, just unbelievable, dude. So, uh, I really appreciate you coming on, dude. And um, I got like six pages of notes right here in front of me, which I think is the most I've ever taken. So, um, great stuff. And uh, you made the curriculum better. You got a curriculum nation. We'll appreciate everything that you've, you've given us. I will definitely tag your email and uh, so they can get a hold of you with um, any of this stuff. And uh, yeah, man, keep on freaking doing traps. Obviously, we'll be in touch. We talk like every day, so. But I appreciate you coming hey. on, man. Hey, and I, I got to say thank you, thank you to your staff, uh, past and present, uh, and thank you to your listeners because I'm so humbled by your comments. I'm so humbled by the ability to have a presence and be here with you, and, and whether it's presenting high school coaches or clinics and stuff. I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. I'm truly a guy who gets to do what he loves. 
regardless of income. And, and with that, income is come. And I am so humbled and great. My mission is to help as many people as I can, period, from the time I have my last breath. So if there's anybody, anytime I can help in any area, any topic, that's what I'm about. That's what I want to do. I've just been fortunate. This, this is my, my avenue to do that. And I can't express how grateful I am to be part of this opportunity. And um, uh, hopefully there's more shows in the future. Uh, as far as the podcast, man, I, I leave that. Like, like you, I just steal from better people than me. So when I talk training or anything like that, you know, it's just like you and I always do. We just take away bits and pieces. I'm nobody. I'm just standing on the shoulders of so many giants in the strength conditioning field and finances, certainly, but and in life. I'm learning how to live a better life through so many friends and mentors. I'm so blessed. I, I'm, I'm just completely grateful to learn from better people. Great perspective, and I, I, I wish that more people could have it. So, uh, once again, thanks, Coach, man. Thank you for the, the words and, and coming on and taking your time. I think that was, I think we just got carried away and talked for a really long time, but I'm very excited about it. So, Everyone, appreciate it, man. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll be in touch. All right, brother. Talk soon. All right, Take brother. Care. Yep, bye-bye. All right. We'll see you guys next week.